All right. Um, hello, everyone. It looks like we've got some few a few people still trickling in, but we'll go ahead and and get started. Uh, thank you for for joining us today. Welcome to our webinar. Today we're going to be talking about how to create manufacturing training that works, and and we'll explain what that means here in just a minute. Um, we'll go for about 25. Keep try and keep it under 30 minutes today. We might be pushing that a little bit, but. We'll try to get as close to that as possible and uh, and still leave a few minutes at the end there for questions, five minutes or so. So if you have any questions during our presentation, go ahead and, and put them in to the chat and, and we'll try and get them uh, at the end. So this webinar is a condensed version of an in-depth guide that we published recently. Uh, and we'll email you a copy of that guide as well as a link to the recorded version of this webinar after we're done here. Probably get that tomorrow or the next day. This webinar is brought to you by Convergence Training. I know there's a few of our customers that are sitting in here with us today, but if you're not familiar with Convergence Training, um, we develop off-the-shelf industrial skills and safety and compliance training courses. And uh, we also have a learning management system that's designed specifically to help manage industrial and manufacturing training programs. We also do custom training and consulting, so if you want to learn more, you can go to convergencetraining.com to see more about what we do, or you can reach out to us after the webinar with any questions. So again, this is a webinar about developing an effective manufacturing training program. I'm JP Dull. I'm the marketing manager here at Convergence Training, and I'm joined today by Jeff Dalto, a senior customer success specialist here, um, where he has also served as a writer, content developer and customer trainer. Jeff has over 20 years of instructional design experience and he's going to be leading us through our webinar here today. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jeff. All right, great. Thanks a lot, JP. And uh, hi, everybody out there. And thanks to all of you for taking some time out of your day to uh, listen in on this webinar. As JP mentioned, uh, I'm going to give you a little method uh, for creating training uh, that works uh, really in any environment or including in manufacturing. Um, that method is going to be based on kind of the fundamentals of instructional design. JP mentioned you'll get a guide. It goes into a lot more detail by uh, necessity. I'm going to be kind of compressed today. So we'll keep it kind of at a roadmap. Uh, we'll do our best to take your questions after. Uh, we'll either do that live or if something's especially detailed or we run out of time, we will uh, get back to you via email. Um, all right, so manufacturing training that works. What, what do we mean by works? One, we mean training, of course, that your workers are going to understand, they're, they're going to remember. But we, we're also talking about uh, training that's going to uh, change your behavior, uh, teach them skills that they will actually, in fact, apply on the job, because that's really your goal. And, and ultimately, the, that, that gets your business moving in a way you want it moving. And we'll, we'll talk about all that in a little bit. We're going to give you a bird's eye view of the entire process, starting with uh, analyzing training needs and business goals, creating learning objectives, creating tests, training materials, and evaluating the effectiveness of your training uh, afterward. So, so here's that uh, roadmap, five points. Let's start by determining your training needs. And, and the first thing you should do and maybe this isn't always obvious, maybe people don't do this when they create training, is uh, think about what, what are the business goal, what business goal or what business goals is my training designed to support? Uh, manufacturers or any company provides training uh, for a reason. They don't just do it uh, for fun. They, they have business goals they want to reach. And so when you're, you, you're tasked with uh, creating training, one of the first things you should do is ask yourself, well, what business goal is this going to help us reach or which business goals? That might be things like increasing revenue and production, decreasing waste and cost, uh, improving compliance. Maybe you're implementing a new machine or, or a new, new process or, or making a new product. You have to teach people uh, uh, what they need to do. But, but start by uh, asking yourself that. What, 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 what's the business goal here? Then, once you've identified one or more business goal, what key performance indicator or KPI is used to measure progress toward that goal? So, you know, this is just a numerical way to measure progress toward a goal. Um, it might be if it's something as simple as uh, looking at profits on a monthly basis as viewed in a graph. Or if you're maybe in safety, maybe you're looking at the number of safety incidents you've had uh, in a graph. So find those business goals, find the KPIs that are used to measure progress towards those goals, 
and then get a baseline measurement using those KPIs before training starts, or even better, uh, a trend. And, and then later we'll 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 measure we'll do training and we'll, we'll measure again, and hopefully you've had a positive effect. Okay, so you're going to start out and de develop training. One of the first things you should do is identify the tasks that need to be performed by people in each job role or in a given job role. Because uh, your goal, of course, is to teach people to do what they need to do at work. So maybe you've got a machine operator and, and they have certain tasks they have to perform, the, the startup inspection, uh, start the machine, feed materials into the machine, and there would be more, of course, but you, you get the point. And, and so once you've identified this list of tasks, next you're gonna take one of these tasks and break it down into the different steps that someone needs to do in order to actually complete that task. You can do this by going out and watching your, your, your best performers in the field, asking them how they do it, interviewing managers, maybe videoing somebody doing this and breaking it down. This is called a task analysis. Again, the guy talks a lot about this, but go ahead and, and, and break that task down into the different steps. And, and that's what you're gonna teach people to do as part of your training. Now, uh, create learning objectives. Before I talk about creating learning objectives, you've, you've, you've kind of analyzed your training needs. We're gonna talk about creating learning objectives next, but so you don't have to sit here and listen to me for 30 minutes straight, we thought it'd be interesting if we do a little poll question here. So I'm gonna select a poll here and launch it. And that should change what you see on your screen. And at this point, you should be seeing a poll and it's asking you if you use learning objectives. So, so let us know if you're, uh, oh, it's working, great. We'll give you a little time. <clears throat> okay, so some people are, are still answering questions, but 80% uh, but, but, um, of you are saying, yeah, I either I know what a learning objective is or I'm, I'm using learning objectives, but 20% of you are saying no. Um, uh, so 80% of you, fantastic, well done. It's a pretty good ratio. 20% of you, uh, hopefully you'll give it some more thought. We're gonna tell you more about what learning objectives are, how to create them, and why to create them, and, and maybe that'll uh, decrease our 20% number. So I'm gonna close this poll. We're gonna go back to our presentation. Uh, you might be, for, for those, especially the 20%, uh, you might be familiar with learning uh, objectives. Maybe you've seen them before training without giving a lot of thought. They often start with that statement. After this training, you will be able to, this is directed to the learner, uh, complete a pre-startup inspection. So for example, that's one of our learning objectives for our machine operator. Well, now as a, a training designer, what you need to sit back, uh, learning objectives are important for you as well because you're gonna determine what's in your training and what's in your tests and everything. So you're gonna sit down and think, hmm, what are my objectives? What do people need to know out of this training? And, and that's a really important uh, aspect. What do people need to know? What, what, what do I really want them? Uh, it's necessary. It's not something I, I want or I think is interesting. Now, when you're writing that learning objective, it's gonna have three parts, a classic learning objective. Performance, conditions, criteria. Performance is critical, it's gonna be in every one. Conditions and criteria may appear, but you should at least consider. So let's break that down. Performance. Here, uh, complete a pre-startup inspection. It's something somebody has to perform, hence the word. It's a verb, it's an action. And, and so you're always gonna address, uh, write your learning objective as a performance. This is what your learner has to do after training. Conditions. Uh, I want you to do it without a written guide. These are the conditions under which you have to complete the performance. Maybe you don't need a condition in your objective, but at least consider it. Your goal is to make uh, your objective as crystal clear as possible. So if ask yourself, do I need a condition here? Criteria, how well does somebody have to perform the performance? In this case, in less than a minute, it might be with 90% uh, accuracy, it might be with no defects. I, again, maybe you don't need criteria, but, but consider it. So that's a classic three-part objective, performance, conditions, criteria. Some other tips for learning objectives. First of all, you know, write them clearly. Your goal is to communicate to the learner and to the uh, whoever's gonna evaluate the learner exactly what that person needs to do in order to satisfy the objective. Uh, don't leave things vague or confusing. Uh, make sure people know exactly what they have to do in order to meet that objective. Don't leave it up to your somewhat secret understanding of what the objective is. And again, it's important that the learner knows and that the person who's gonna evaluate the learner knows and that anyone reading your objective can, can, would, would agree, this is what the person would have to 
perform in order to satisfy that objective. Okay, we talked about learning objectives now. They're critical for your training. Uh, and you'll use them when you create tests, which is what we're recommending that you do next, which might catch you off guard. Uh, we're recommending creating tests after you create your learning objectives, but before you make your training materials. Now, you don't have to do this, you, and, and my guess is a lot of you don't. That could have been an interesting poll question itself, actually. Um, but at least consider it. And the reason for this is um, if you want your, your test to be very directly mapped to your learning objective, now is a good time to create those tests because you, you just did the learning objectives are fresh in your mind. You can crest, create test items for each objective, uh, and, and then you can create materials that will teach the objectives. So give it a shot if you're not doing it currently. Maybe you'll, you'll grow to like it. Now, um, remember those tests are gonna be directly mapped to your learning objectives. So every objective has to have at least one item or more that tests or assess your learners on the objective. And you don't wanna create test items for things that are not in your learning objectives, which uh, you know you might have seen yourself in some job training where if somebody's asked a, a question that's you know not in the objective. So avoid that. Keep your training lean when possible. Now these tests might be task-based test, I want you to do something, or knowledge-based test, do you know something? Uh, a task-based test, someone's gonna go, probably do something out in the, in, the, in the field. Show me how you do the machine inspection checklist. Or maybe they'll do something in a training room. Maybe you'll have a scenario-based thing where you're maybe even teaching someone in sales how to deal with a customer for, for the products you manufacture. But they're gonna do something. So you'll have some kind of task-based training. We have a lot of information about that on our blog as well. Uh, you might have knowledge-based training as well. A lot of times in manufacturing, there's a set of knowledge that people uh, need to know, and we're gonna talk about this more later, in order to perform their job. Uh, you're not paying them to be uh, databases of knowledge, but they need that knowledge in order to do uh, this procedure or, that, or, or whatever. So these might be multiple choice tests, uh, true, false, might be an essay, maybe just a verbal discussion. Okay, you got those tests next in our little roadmap here, point four, we're gonna create our training materials. Again, a ton of information about this on our blog, uh, a lot of links in the guide that you get that'll take you to those uh, bits of information. But uh, let's give you a couple high level uh, tips. First, your training materials have to follow your learning objectives. Make sure you're, you're including information that teaches people to, to satisfy each objective and equally critically, make sure you don't include any any other information that isn't directly related to your learning objectives. Uh, people tend to put in uh, nice to know information. They tend to put in information that is they think is interesting, that maybe for some reason might uh, motivate the learner, but, but, but it doesn't. Research shows this actually decreases or depresses learning. So uh, the, the old cliche in, in training or learning is that less is more, and it's truly the case. So Keep it lean and, and focus on your learning objectives. Keep it active. Learn, people learn better by doing. So if you can have them physically do something like we're seeing here, great. Um, but, but if not, you know, have them talking, have them answering questions, have them doing uh, case studies or scenario-based role-playing or, or whatever. Don't tell me what to do and, and then ask me if I, I know what to do. Tell me what to do, show me what to do, have me do it as whatever form of do it is, and to try to avoid a passive lecture. Now, your workers, I think in almost all cases out there are gonna be adults. Adults share certain characteristics that we call learning principles um, that make them learn better. Let's look at those. Here they are. Um, if your training in includes this kind of stuff, your, your employees are gonna learn more. Uh, like you and me, probably um, everyone likes to be self-directed. They maybe can't be in charge of all aspects of their training, but the more you can let them be in charge of the of aspects of their training, the, the more likely they're gonna to be to learn. They come to training with a, a life full of knowledge and experience already. When you're giving them new information, try to connect that new information to existing information. And that's critical for how people learn. You're taking information from the active memory and you're helping them store it by integrating it with information that's in their long-term memory. They're goal oriented. Basically what they wanna know is what's in it for me. Um, if you give them a pitch at the beginning of training, this is what's in it for you. If it's convincing and persuasive and they, they, they share that goal and they see your logic, you are gonna get their buy-in. Cause you know, their goal at that point is the same as yours. They wanna learn that thing cause they see how it helps them. So always try to present a what's in it for me. And of course always present training that truly does help them reach a real goal for them. 
task oriented. And uh, if you look back to high school, we used to kind of exhaustively study a, a topic like biology. Adults don't do that, uh, certainly not on the job. They want to know how to do task A or task B. And of course, it should be tasks that they'll perform on the job. So keep your training task oriented. People learn better when they're motivated. If you do a lot of what we said already, they will be motivated. Let them be self-directed. Show them what's in it. You know, what are, what's a goal? What's in it for me? Uh, keep it task oriented. This is something I'm going to have to do tomorrow on the job. And, and they need respect. So of course, always you know talk in a respectful way. Treat them with respect. But if you look back at what we just said here, if you if you let them be self-directed and if if you address their past experiences and, and you show that this is a, a a reasonable goal and, and you keep it relevant to job tasks, that all shows respect as well. Keep things short. The human brain is a, uh, an amazing organ, but it also can only process a very limited amount of information at any one time. Uh, learning experts say like four things, four to five things for 15 seconds, and then you just forget it and it's lost. So you can't give someone too much information. So one way to uh, keep things manageable is to do what we call chunking. So if you've got a, a, a large content uh, bit of information to teach someone, break it down into little bite-sized pieces. Think of the most logical way to organize those pieces. Present pe uh, just a few pieces at a time, again, maybe four or five. Give some kind of opportunity for practice or break, and then move on. Maybe even come back the next day. Um, if you look at this person on the screen, for example, they're doing uh, completing an e-learning course from Convergence Training which is similar to most e-learning courses. And there's a reason they're set up the way they are. You've got a, a single screen, it's about 30 or 60 seconds. It's talking about one or maybe two things. There's a next button that's controlled by the learner. So I get a chunk of information. I only move forward when I'm ready. I get the next chunk. And in a few chunks, I'm gonna get some opportunity to practice my knowledge. So you can apply that same stuff in your own training, including in instructor-led training. The human brain, uh, the organ with which we learn, has two processing channels. One channel for words, uh, and those words could be spoken or, or, or written, and, and the other channel for visual information, um, pictures, videos, r the, the real world, as we're experiencing it right now. If you pr create training that integrates both words and visuals, uh, research shows, again, there's a lot of studies on this, that uh, the training efficiency and effectiveness in terms of learner retention, comprehension, later transfer the job, skyrockets. So keep that in mind. Uh, E-learning is great for that, you know, and you know, lots of companies, including ours, can make really fancy stuff. We do a lot of 3D stuff. But, you know, this could just be you in front of a course, in front of a classroom, uh, scribbling on a whiteboard, something I do a lot. I'm, I know some people out there know me from LMS trainings, and uh, you vouch for me. I do a lot of scribbling on a whiteboard, and I, it's effective. Um, as well. So it doesn't have to be super sophisticated. We have a lot of tips for uh, creating visuals on our blog as well. Speak your learner's language. Now, of course, I'm talking if, if they speak Spanish or Thai or German or French, speak in those languages or have someone who does. But um, I'm also saying in a more uh, converse, be more conversational. A lot of times people fall into the habit of being especially um, academic, or stiff or formal during training. And, and that's not necessary. You know, address your learners as you talk in a casual way, the same way you talk to them at the water cooler or at the coffee machine. So avoid that overly academic language, avoid overly formal language, um, avoid jargon, uh, terms that are special to an industry, specialized terms, unexplained acronyms, those abbreviations. If you need to use those things, make sure you're defining them and not just using them when people don't have no idea what you're talking about. All right. We mentioned earlier that people take new information uh, in their working memory and they try to relate it to existing information in a long-term memory. And, and as a trainer, you want to help them do that. You're trying to create hooks to, so they can take the new information and hook it to the existing information. Uh, analogies, comparisons, similes, metaphors, these things help. So anytime you're taking new information, if you can compare it to something I already know, uh, do it. A great example, of course, would be uh, you're teaching me uh, one machine and you're comparing it to how the machine I already know works. But it could be something from real life too. Maybe it's something in a TV show that we all know and watch or a book that everyone's read. Okay, now when you're thinking about all this kind of training, and we've touched on this a little bit, uh, you're gonna teach people different kinds of information. I've got five here, we'll talk you through them in a second. And, and you might vary the kind of training you deliver based on the type of information you're trying to convey. So we've got facts, concepts, processes, 
procedures and what we're calling problems here, but but really a kind of higher order thinking. And I'll, I'll talk about that more in just a second. So let's look at each of these uh, and, and learn more about them and how you can train people effectively for each kind of information. So, so a fact is just a simple statement. Uh, X is Y, as we're seeing here. My coworker, John Paul, he's from Oregon. But, but they're also essentially random. John Paul could easily have been from South Dakota. He's just not. It's hard to remember all these things. It's not an efficient way to store information. So if, first, my t first tip for you is, hey, if it's not necessary to force people to memorize facts, don't make them do it. Can you create a job aid that, and, and post it by the HMI of a machine that shows me the codes I need to enter? If so, do it. Let me remember important stuff. Let me refer to job aids. But if you do, if I do need to memorize facts, and, and it's true, there are times when I do, if you create uh, things like labeled diagrams, maybe showing me the parts of a machine, present information in tables and lists, that will help me memorize facts. You can also do drill and practice like we did as kids. Um, nicely, you can use e-learning now for some of that. You don't have to use flashcards or, or just sit there and verbally do it with me. Now, concepts. Concepts are things that share a certain set of characteristics. For example, boilers have uh, certain things in common. All boilers do. And all presses have certain things in common. At home, uh, all house cats have certain things in common. All dogs have certain things in common. House cats, for example, have four legs, fur, a tail, whiskers, and they meow. So when you are training people uh, to recognize, you know, members of a that, that in a concept like a boiler, boiler A and boiler B, what you want to do is uh, include that definition. What are those shared characteristics that make a boiler a boiler or that make a house cat a house cat? Give me some examples. Show me boiler A, boiler B, boiler C. Uh, if it's a house cat, show me uh, a Siamese and a Persian and a Scottish fold or whatever. In addition, Show me some bad examples or what may be a non-example, uh, a closely related non-example. For, for our, our house cat example, uh, our concept, a great example would be, or non-example would be a lion. You know, it's closely related to house cat. We, we can see the, the similarity, but, it, but it's clearly not a house cat. So uh, that's a good aspect for training people on concepts. Processes, manufacturing runs on processes. It might be literally a physical process like we're seeing sketched out here. Maybe it's a workflow. Maybe it's uh, something that happens on a computer. But regardless, your workers are going to have to learn many processes, and, and that will change over time. Um, so when you're teaching processes, uh, the first thing you want to do is clearly identify and explain each stage. So there's stage A, there's stage B, there's stage C. This is what happens at stage A, what happens at stage B, and so on. And, and if you can, try to lean on visuals. And we're going to keep coming back to the importance of visuals and training over and over again because we are visual animals and our brain efficiently processes vi visual information and is attracted to that information. Uh, use diagrams, flow charts, tables, lists, anything you can to visualize that and illustrate that information effectively. Procedures. All your workers have to perform procedures. And it, it, this is big in manufacturing, but it's true everywhere. Uh, it's true in software companies. A procedure is a numbered sequential list of how to do something. Step one, step two, step three. Uh, our examples are machine startup list. Uh, we're seeing another uh, procedure here. Uh, here you want to clearly list the steps to your workers. You want to demonstrate the procedure step by step, then let them practice, uh, give them uh, feedback live, real time while they're doing it, and then let them go out and do it in the field. So that's a nice simple way to do it. If you're looking for a little more detail on that, we have a very recent blog post about training within industry, the, the training method for lean uh, manufacturing and it goes into their own uh, job instruction method for teaching procedures. Okay, what we call problems. I said earlier this is kind of higher order thinking, uh, advanced thinking skills. Uh, in L&D it's often called principles. Uh, you might think of it as analyzing, synthesizing, and evaluating information, creating things of new value. Uh, it might It's going to include things like optimizing performance, problem solving, troubleshooting. And really what it is, it's the, it's the high value, it's the stuff that your high value employees with lots of experience do. They take all that information they've already learned. They take their 20 years of job experience and, and they make you, you, your company more productive, more efficient. Uh, so, for example, a, uh, so, somebody who's been operating a paper machine for 20 years, they know all these facts, concepts, processes. They know their procedures. They have all sorts of uh work experience. And every day they're going to apply that to make the paper coming out of that machine better. Maybe uh, it's wet today and they're going to, uh, they know what to tweak to make it drier. 
Another example comes from lean manufacturing. There are certain uh, concepts that, that are uh, baked into lean manufacturing. You should always strive to increase value. Value should be measured by the customer. You want to go for a, a, a pull system, not, not a push system. You want to create flow. You want uh, continuous improvement. But, but how you actually apply those things in, is different for every, every time. It'll be different from department A to department B in your, in your work area. It's going to be different if you're a lean manufacturing consultant from company A to company B. So, so the, that's where this expertise comes in. Now, uh, a lot of times this expertise just kind of builds uh, gradually by osmosis, if you will, because someone's been working for you for 20 years. But, but that's not an efficient way uh, or not the most efficient way to develop it. You can actually include this in your training. Uh, a lot of community college, for example, offer courses on troubleshooting. Um, if you give people, uh, first of course, that necessary information over time, those facts, concepts, processes, procedures, and then actually set up opportunities for them to work practice that in, in realistic scenario-based training, you're going to see that that 20 years can be, be drastically reduced. And, and, and that's, you know, really, I think one of the things you want most in training, how can I get, how can I shorten the amount of time to which I have a really high performing employee? That's very valuable. Okay. We've taken those kinds of information and kind of created what we call a training pyramid. At the bottom, we have that knowledge, facts, concept, process, in the middle, procedures. And, and again, at the top, that, that kind of higher order thinking we we're talking about that includes the ability to solve problems, create new value, maybe entirely new process or uh, entirely new product for you. And the reason we did that is because if you think about each of these levels, you can use, uh, it's not a hard, fast rule, but you can use different kinds of training to deliver this information to your workers. Um, so at the bottom, that information based stuff, uh, you know, written materials, computer based e learning, videos that can be really effective at this level. And, and you don't have to use instructor-led time quite so much for there. At the middle of those procedures, task-based training. It's going to include uh, maybe a supervisor or a coworker. Um, and, and I'm going to go out in the field, I'm going to do something. And then maybe at the top, you're going to, uh, I'm going to have an instructor. Uh, you know, we're going to be, and maybe it'll be some classroom training, maybe it'll be in the field, there'll be a hands-on aspect. Uh, but you're setting up something with, with instructor. Now, it's not a hard and fast rule, but see, you can you can really lean on, on e-learning there at the bottom or videos or written materials. You can optimize your instructor-led time uh, in the top two and especially the top. Okay, fifth uh, step. We've now created um, uh, training materials. We've now... Um, talked about some, some tips for creating them. And, and now we're going to deliver and evaluate the effectiveness of that training. Now, delivery, we're not going to go into a lot here. There's a lot on the blog. The uh, Association for Talent Development Professional Organization has a lot as well. Um, we're going to talk about evaluating, though. And, and training classically is evaluated at four levels. Uh, that some of you might know this Kirk Patrick's method. And, and those levels are reaction sheets, surveys uh, handed out to your workers right after training, tests, you know, task-based or written test. And then after the training, uh, observing on-the-job behavior and uh, going back and tracking using KPIs, uh, the business results. Did, am I approaching my business goal? So we're going to uh, take another pause for the cause. Uh, I'm going to let you guys do a little work while, while I sit and watch. I'm going to launch a second of these polls, our second of our two polls today. And what I want to know, I, I bet a lot of you are familiar with reaction sheets and tests, but I want to know how many of you are actively tracking on-the-job behavior and business results. So that's what we mean here for your training. And going back and uh, not just tracking it, but using it to evaluate the effectiveness of your training and tweaking your training, depending on what you're getting. All right, this is pretty fun. I can see the uh, answers rolling in. And about 90% of you have voted. And uh, so we got 41% are doing it sometime. 32% don't do it at all. And and 30% of you do it. So again, let's we're going to talk about all these methods of evaluation. Um, but we encourage you if you're not doing it or you, or if you're only doing it sometimes, you know, consider doing it more. All right, so I'm going to close this. We should go back to our presentation at this point. Reaction sheets. My guess is a lot of you are familiar with these. Maybe you use them. Uh, you hand them out to your learners during training. If you were, if you're asking, uh, these are effective, but you need to ask the right questions. So uh, try to avoid, did you like training? Did you like the trainer? You're, you're, you know, you're t just gonna, people tend to say, yes, they're excellent. And, and, and that's why these are sometimes dismissively known as smiley sheets. Instead, tell them, did I deliver on what I said I delivered? Uh, these were the learning objectives. Did you learn this objective? Did you learn that objective? Do you feel prepared to go out and do this in a field? 
and, and try to provide places not just for people to check boxes, but to write comments. So you can get good information from this reaction sheet. It's certainly not where evaluation ends. Um, and remember, it's important the questions you're asking. Tests. Now, again, this might be a task-based test. I want to see you perform something. Or maybe it's a written test. But, but either way, this gives you a chance to uh, assess the, the knowledge or, or abilities of each individual learner. It gets you the ability to uh, see how people did an entire class. How, how's my, my trainer doing? How's my training materials doing? You can evaluate that over time. Is my training getting better over time? And so on. So these are certainly important. Now, uh, this higher, this level three and level four stuff after training, go out in the field and see if people are doing it. Um, the human brain, as we mentioned several times, uh, has a tendency to forget. Um, and presenting information once does not mean uh, you know, I have got it for the rest of my life. So go out in the field and see if people are doing it. If they're doing it, great. Congratulate them. You know, get, tell them. Um, but if they're not, remind them. Give them some help. And maybe over time, you'll have to provide some refresher training or, or re change your training because it wasn't effective. And then finally, and this is where we're going to wrap up today, uh, you know, measure those KPIs again, uh, not just once, but over time. Compare them to the KPIs you, you created uh, and measured before training. And, and with luck, you're going to see a positive uh, improvement in your KPIs showing that you're moving towards or have reached your business goals. Okay, so uh, in review, we uh, started by determining training needs. We created objectives. We created tests. We created materials. We delivered our training. And then we talked about four ways to evaluate. And at this point, we are going to, uh, I'm done, everybody. So we're going to see if there are any questions in the chat field. Uh, John Paul has helped me with that. I, I see that there is a question. All right, my new friend. Uh, and I apologize, I, uh, uh, Simpui, who I met a day or two ago on, on LinkedIn, who's from South Africa, Johannesburg region. Um, I hope I pronounced it correctly. Uh, hi, Jeff. When I develop, I start with learning material and then the questions. I fear creating a question that I later forget to cover in the module. Well, I, I can't blame you for that. Later, when creating questions, I might then find out something I missed. Is it a hard rule to start with questions before? No, uh, so it's not a hard rule. Um, uh, and ultimately, uh, but it might be something to consider. But but here's what I think is most important. And, you, and, and your uh, fear is rightly placed. Uh, you said, I fear creating a question that I forget to cover in the module. So what I would recommend is, is creating a checklist. And so at some point you can, uh, when you're you think you're done creating your training, look at your learning objectives, see if they're all covered in, in your uh, test or your training assessments, see if they're all covered in your materials, and and and, and ask yourself is everything covered in all three things? And and, and that that's your fear is leaving something out. That's the right fear. And and and. As long as you've got it covered and you create a little checklist and you've evaluated it, you're good. Um, do you have to create tests first? No. Maybe give it a shot, but don't feel hard bound to do that. So good question. I hope I pronounced your name right. Good to see you here online. Um, anybody else? Okay. Well, uh, we hope that this was helpful. Oh, here's one here. Well, okay, how do you overcome the problem when you have people who can't use computers for e-learning? Uh, another good question from M. Myram. Hello. Um, so there's a couple, well, I guess my first question would be, why can't people use computers for e-learning? First of all, is it because they um, don't have a computer? If so, that's an infrastructure issue and, and one that I can't really solve. But I think what you're saying is they don't have the computer skills, low education, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, I got a little clarification. It, it's a computer skill issue. And, and, and one of the things we glossed over a little early, but it's covered in our guide, is to do uh, not just a task analysis, but a, but a learner analysis. So M. Myram or Miram or, or however you pronounce your name, I'm sorry, I don't know. You're, you're spot on in asking this question. And one of, the, one of the things I think is really critical before you deliver uh, create training is do a learner analysis and, and, and find out a lot about your learners, including do we have a low education issue that's going to prevent my workers from being able to use e-learning? And, and, and if you can identify that you have a problem, you, you've got a couple routes uh, to go. You know, if, if there's an absolutely, uh, um, if there's an obstacle that will prevent people from using e-learning and computers, frankly, you need to focus on training that doesn't involve e-learning and computers. You know, you really need to uh, optimize uh, 
maybe video-based training or something that's simpler, or, or maybe have uh, some way where an instructor, one thing we encourage a lot is, and, and, and uh, again, if I, apologies if I mispronounced the name, but I recently met Sim, Simfwi, if I said that correctly, from South Africa on LinkedIn while discussing toolbox talks. And, and one thing we encourage a lot is maybe have an instructor uh, do a blended learning presentation in front of people where maybe the instructor is using the uh, the computer on behalf of the learners and, and people are watching things together and then you get an opportunity to um, to take a uh, uh, to have a discussion between screens or something so you could have an instructor operating the computer uh, you can lean on written materials instructor led training or over time and I realize this takes time but you can actually uh, teach workers to use uh, those computers. Because uh, the reality is I think e-learning is gonna become an increasingly uh, common and important part of job training. So hopefully that helps. I know it's a difficult question to answer. Uh, another question from YC GAN, I believe. What ways do you use to assess post-training effectively? That's a good question as well. And, and, and the, the, the two ways I can give you that, in, and I apologize, essentially just repeating myself. One, observing, uh, in the field behaviors are people applying this um, and then two uh, measuring the kpis this is having a direct business goal so so i hope uh, that's a little uh, superficial um, we do have an additional uh, blog post on that and, and i'm going to try to shoot you off a, a little bit more detailed information in a in an email yc gan um, christopher hammer do you have any suggestions for good training document control in a manufacturing environment with four crews and 24-7 operations? We issue instructions, get signatures on compliance, but have terrible follow-through to ensure everyone remains compliant afterwards. Um, I do, actually. Uh, you know, Convergence Training uh, is a training solutions provider. John Paul mentioned some of the things we, we create. One is a learning management system, which has full document control capabilities. So uh, if it's an SOP or a troubleshooting guide or, or a company policy, uh, if you were uh, using our learning management system, and it doesn't have to be ours, but of course we're fans of ours, um, you can take that, that written material, you can, or, or it could be in other formats as well, you can easily import it into our learning management system. You can give your workers access to that, either as an assignment or uh, just as a, as a uh, uh, optional kind of reference based uh, making it available access and and you and you can later if you need to easily um, update that that uh, material over time as a process change or, or procedure changes or a policy changes you can give all the workers access who need it um, in a simple one step two step assignment and we also have um, apps that run on mobile devices so if you want to, people to be able to have access to that in the field maybe your maintenance person who needs to um, see a maintenance procedure and the guidelines uh, for that. They can have uh, all that information at their fingertips, literally, um, uh, by, even by scanning a barcode. If I go to the first machine, uh, scan a barcode, I get all the information related to machine A. If I go to the next machine or work area, scan a barcode, I get all the information related to machine B. Click a button and I see that procedure. So hopefully that, that helps. Those uh, mobile devices include the ability to gather signatures, by the way. All right, so that was a good question. And we're back to M. Myram. Is there a checklist for all the steps you have mentioned for preparing a training? Fantastic question. And, and, and the answer currently is no. And I, that's uh, my fault. JP asked me to create one. I apologize. I ran out of time. I've been doing a couple of things. We will, however, create one. Um, that's on, on, our, our, uh, on our list. We will create this guide. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. It's already created. And, and you guys will get this in a day or two. So, uh, if you'll bear with me, I apologize, and, and kind of use a guide just to check off as you're going, that would be helpful. But um, that's one of our goals soon, is to create a similar checklist like that. We will be releasing that on the Convergence Training blog. If you go to Convergence Training, www.convergencetraining.com or blog.convergencetraining.com, you can sign up uh, for our newsletter. And if you're not a daily reader of our blog, you would get a uh, monthly newsletter and that would ultimately include that checklist. So, so great question. Um, my fault for my bad for not having it. And we'll try to get that to you. Okay. I think we're going to wrap it up here. We thank everybody. I'm going to hand this back to JP. Have a great day. Thanks for your time. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Um, like Jeff said, we're going to follow up with you guys here with uh, the recorded version of this webinar, uh, a link to the guide that this webinar is developed 
uh, around and some additional blog posts that cover some of the things we talked about more in depth. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, our learning management system like we had one earlier, our, our content, our custom training, or anything we really talked about today, you can reach out to us at media at convergencetraining.com. You can reach out to Jeff at jdalto at convergencetraining.com. And visit our website, and like Jeff mentioned, you can also sign up for our newsletter there and uh, and get all this kind of stuff uh, right in your inbox uh, every month. So we appreciate you guys joining us today, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next time. Have a great day.